Statistics is the bedrock of science and data analysis. This is why we all learn about it in some form or fashion in school. However, many of our favorite statistical techniques are completely useless when applied to a certain type of data. This specific type of data are called power laws. In this video, I'll be giving a beginner friendly introduction to power laws and describe three problems that come up when trying to apply our standard statistical tools to analyze them. If you're new to the channel, I'm Shaw. I make content about data science and entrepreneurship. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. That's a great no cost way to support me and all the videos that I make. And with that, let's get into it. So the official title of this talk is Pareto, Power Laws and Fat Tales, What They Don't Teach You in Statistics. So I'll start with the background information. I'll talk about the Gaussian distribution, Pareto's 80-20 rule, introduce the power law class and describe the difference between weight and wealth. Then I'll move on to three big problems when trying to use traditional statistical approaches to analyze data following a power law distribution. And then finally, I will introduce the idea of fat tails, which generalizes a key property of these power law distributions. So many quantities in nature tend to clump around a typical value. One example of this is if you go to a busy coffee shop, and measure the weights of all the customers coming in and out of the coffee shop, you would eventually observe a pattern like the one shown here. So in other words, the weights would tend to clump around some typical value and then decay rapidly toward these tails. This is a distribution that most people are familiar with. It's called a Gaussian distribution, also called a bell curve. And the great thing about data that follows a Gaussian distribution is that we can capture a lot of the essential information of the underlying data with just a single number, which is the mean. And you can go even further and capture how spread out this distribution is via measures like the standard deviation. And so these concepts of a Gaussian, the mean, the standard deviation, variance, etc. These are all concepts that people will learn in an introductory statistics course or a business statistics course. And indeed, these are powerful techniques for analyzing data, solving problems, and making decisions. However, not all data that we care about follows a distribution like a Gaussian. And a great example of this comes from the work of Vilfredo Pareto. And so many people have probably heard of Pareto's principle or the 80-20 rule. And typically how this is quoted is that 80% of sales come from 20% of customers. However, this idea did not originate from the business world or sales and marketing. It actually originated from the work of an Italian an economist and mathematician Vilfredo Pareto in his study of Italian land ownership where he found that about 80% of the land in Italy was owned by about 20% of the citizens. This simple observation is indicative of statistics that are very different from the Gaussian distribution that we saw in the coffee shop. And so what this 80-20 rule or Pareto principle implies is that the underlying data follows a Pareto distribution, which looks looks like this. Just qualitatively, this looks very different than the Gaussian distribution from the previous slide. And the biggest difference here is that there's no typical value around which the data is clumped. So in the case of a Gaussian, the mean is very representative of the overall distribution. However, when looking at a Pareto distribution, the mean doesn't give you a whole lot of information. So in this case, the mean is going to be somewhere around here, which doesn't tell you much about a lot of the data that's living in the so-called tail over here. Putting this another way, while knowing the average weight of an Italian man gives you a good idea of what to expect on your next trip to Rome, knowing the average population of an Italian city, which is about 7,500, is completely useless in grounding your expectations. And the reason for this is that weight tends to follow a Gaussian distribution, while city populations tend to follow a Pareto distribution. So the Pareto distribution is actually part of a broader class of distributions called power laws. And so here are a few different power laws. In red, we actually see a power law matching this 80-20 rule like we saw in the previous slide. Making this a bit more general, a power law is defined by this equation here. So PDF is the probability density function. X is a random variable. Little x is some specific value of that random variable. L of x is some slowly varying function. And then 
alpha is just some number which defines the shape of the distribution here. And another important note is that power laws are only defined beyond a minimum value. So in these plots here, the minimum value is one, but this value could be anything. These two types of distributions, the Gaussian-like distributions, and now these like Pareto-like power law distributions, they give us these two conceptual anchors by which we can qualitatively categorize data that we observe in the real world. Author Nassim Nicholas Taleb in his book, The Black Swan, defines these two categories as mediocristan and extremistan, where mediocristan are the Gaussian-like data, while extremistan are the Pareto-like data. And so the key property of data from mediocristan is that no single observation will significantly impact the aggregate statistics. To see an example of this, suppose on your trip to Rome, you go visit the Colosseum, and then again, you have your scale with you and you decide to start weighing random strangers at the Colosseum. So let's say you weigh a thousand people at the Colosseum and compute the average, and it turns out to be 175 pounds. Then suppose you add to this 1,000 person sample the heaviest Italian that you can find. And so if you do this, this will have very little impact on the mean. The average might go from 175 pounds to 175.25 pounds. And this is the key property of data from mediocristan, which is again that no single observation will significantly impact the aggregate statistics. There's going to be no person on earth that you can add to this sample that will dramatically change the mean of the weight distribution. However, data from extremistan is different. In this case, a single observation can and often will drive the aggregate statistics. So let's say instead of weighing people at the Colosseum, you ask them what their net worth is. Again, you get that same sample of 1,000 people and you compute their mean net worth and you find it to be about $300,000. And then let's say you add the richest Italian to the sample. What's going to happen here is that the average net worth is going to go from about $300,000 to $7.5 million. So about a 25x increase in the average from just a single observation. And so that's the key property of data from extremistan and data following a Pareto-like distribution. To get a bit more intuition about this, here's some more examples from mediocristan and extremistan respectively. Gaussian-like data will be things like IQ, weight, height, calorie consumption, test scores, car accidents, mortality rates, blood pressure. On the other side, data from extremistan will be things like wealth, as we saw at the Coliseum, sales, as people talk about with the 80-20 rule in business, city populations, which we mentioned earlier, pandemics, deaths in wars and terrorist attacks, word occurrences and text, a very small number of words will be used the most amount of times, academic citations, a very small number of researchers get the bulk of the citations, and company sizes. There are very few number of companies that employ most of the world's workforce. As you can see, the things that live in Extremistan isn't some trivial set of things. In fact, you could argue that most of the things that we care about as a society and civilization are not Gaussian-like at all. All. While this may seem just like splitting hairs, some like technical exercise of categorizing data as Gaussian-like or Pareto-like, it turns out there are major limitations to our standard statistical tools in analyzing data from extremistan. And so here I'll highlight three such problems with using our so-called STAT 101 techniques to try to analyze these quantities that we care about. And so this all boils down to one thing, the law of large numbers. Which which basically says, if we take n random samples, the sample mean will approach the true mean as the number of samples goes to infinity. Put another way, if we start collecting data generated from a Gaussian distribution, as we collect more and more samples, more and more observations, the average that we compute from our sample will approach the true average of the underlying distribution. This is also true for the Pareto distribution and our uniform distribution distribution and a log normal distribution. Any distribution that has a finite mean, the law of large numbers is true. However, in practice, we never have infinite data. We can only have a certain number of observations. And this results in some complications with the law of large numbers assumption. If we take 10 observations, we'll get a pretty accurate sample mean of a Gaussian distribution. However, if we take 10 observations of something generated from a Pareto distribution, the sample mean is going
going to be biased. This is all because the law of large numbers works more slowly for power laws than Gaussian distributions. Which brings us to our first problem. The mean is meaningless, as well as many other metrics. When it comes to working with finite sample sizes of data that follows a power law distribution, is that it takes much longer for the mean to converge to the true value compared to a Gaussian. So we can see this from the plots shown here. So on the left, we have the number of samples on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, we have the sample mean. So this black line here is the true mean, and then the blue line is the mean that we compute when the data is generated from a Gaussian, while this orange line here is the mean that we compute when the data is generated from a Pareto distribution. As you can see, the Gaussian is never too far off from the true value. You know, maybe in the super small sample sizes, you have a biased mean, but pretty quickly it starts to get really close to the true value. However, for the power law, we can see the sample mean is not only much more biased than the Gaussian, but it's also much more erratic. And this extends to not just small sample sizes like 100 observations, but to 1,000 observations and even 10,000 observations. This whole time, the Pareto sample mean is much more erratic than the Gaussian and much more biased. This even extends to when we 10x the sample size even more to 100,000 observations. At this point, the Gaussian is right on the money. The mean isn't changing at all with additional observations. However, with the power law, the mean is still wiggling around and not quite the true value. And so we're seeing bias at 100,000 observations for the power law, similar to what we were seeing at about 10 observations for the Gaussian. But this isn't limited to just the mean. We see this for many other standard statistical quantities. That's what's being shown here. On the left-hand side of these plots, we have the respective quantity. So we have the median, the standard deviation, the variance, the mean, the max, first percentile, the 99th percentile, the kurtosis, and entropy. And then horizontally oriented, we have 100 samples, the 1,000 sample case, and the 10,000 sample case. So while some of these quantities are relatively stable, like the median, once you get to sufficient sample size, it tends to level out. The minimum value, even in small sample size, it's pretty accurate. And the first percentile in small sample size is pretty accurate and stable. Some of these other quantities can't seem to land on a particular value. So name namely standard deviation, variance, the maximum, the 99th percentile to some extent, kurtosis, and then entropy seems to continually be changing without end. So the one quantity I want to highlight here is the maximum. And that's because given this property that rare events drive the statistics of power law distributions, as sample size increases, we see a order of magnitude increase in the maximum value when we go from 1,000 samples to 10,000 samples. The danger here is that you could have a maximum value that seems stable in a relatively small sample size. Let's say you have 7,000 observations and the max value seems to have plateaued and it seems pretty stable. But then as you collect more data, you have this huge jump in the max value. And so the danger here is that you can be in this period where it seems like things are stable and predictable, but then all of a sudden you have this huge change in in the data that you're observing. So to connect this to the real world, if this data were say deaths from a pandemic, what this might look like is the deadliest pandemic in a hundred year time span will be an order of magnitude less severe than a pandemic in a thousand year time span. The deadliest pandemic in the past hundred years was the Spanish flu, which killed about 50 million people. And we might think, okay, that was the deadliest pandemic. It's not gonna get any worse than that. If the data is following a power law, we can't be surprised surprised if over a thousand year time period, the deadliest pandemic claims 500 million victims. So this is highlighting this key property of data from Extremistan, which is that rare events drive the underlying statistics. However, this doesn't stop with the mean and all the other standard statistical quantities that we see here. It also impacts our ability to make predictions effectively, which brings us to problem two, regression doesn't work. So what regression boils down to is 
predicting future events from past data. And intuitively, if your data is driven by rare events, you may simply just not have enough past observations to make good predictions about the future. And this problem is exacerbated when working with power law distributions. So let's look at a particular example. Let's suppose that we want to do linear regression between the variables x and y. Here, x is a normally distributed random variable. M and B are the parameters that we're trying to learn. And E is a noise term that follows a power law distribution. So one case where regression just completely breaks down is when this noise term has an alpha value. That tail index we saw earlier when we defined power laws is less than or equal to two. Because in this case, the power law has infinite variance. So the variance of this noise term is going to be infinity. And it turns out if the variance of this noise term is infinite, then the variance of this whole equation will be infinite, which makes the R squared value go to zero. There's a quick derivation of this in citation number two linked in the description below in chapter 6.7. But of course, you can't observe infinite variance in practice because your data is necessarily finite. So what's going to happen when doing regression in practice is going to be similar to what we saw before with the max value, where the results might seem stable in small sample size, but then break down as more data are collected. We can see this through an example, taking our normally distributed random variable with the added power law noise term and doing a linear regression with a hundred samples. The results of our regression might look like this, which looks pretty good. You know, maybe there's some outliers here, but overall we get a pretty good fit and the R squared isn't bad. However, this is incorrect because the noise term has infinite variance, which means R squared should should actually be zero in this case. And indeed, as we collect more and more data, we can see the R squared value quickly deteriorating. So we go from 100 samples to 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 to a million to 10 million to 100 million and so on. This is the danger of doing regression with data that follows a power law. Your results might look deceivingly well in small sample size, but then as you collect more data, your model performance quickly deteriorates. But at this point, you might say, Shaw, what's the big deal? You know, so what if our model can't predict some super rare events like these, like one in a thousand, one in 10,000, et cetera, events? The model can predict 99% of things pretty well. Why do we care about these super rare events? And I agree with you. When data are generated from a power law, it's not hard to be right most of the time because most of the data do not live in this long tail of the power law. However, when solving problems and making decisions in the real world, world, probabilities are only half of the story. The other half of the story are payoffs, which brings us to problem number three. Payoffs diverge from probability. In other words, it's not just about how often you are right or wrong, but also what happens when you're right or wrong. So let's see what this might look like in a business context. Consider a software company with three key offerings. Offer one is they have a free software that has ads. They have a premium offer, which it's no ads with some monthly subscription. And then they have a third offer, which is a enterprise level software with different customizations and add-ons and whatever those clients need. And let's say that the 80-20 rule is in play. So 80% of sales comes from 20% of customers. What this might look like is that 80% of customers go with offer one. They just use the free version. 16% of customers use the premium version. And then 4% of clients are the enterprise clients. What this means for revenue is that 20% of the revenue comes from the free users, 16% of the revenue comes from the premium users, and 64% of the revenue, most of the revenue, comes from the enterprise customers. So let's say the software company wants to optimize the core service, making it run 25% more efficiently. And as any good company might do, they're not just gonna roll this out blindly, they're gonna ask the customers first. They're gonna ask their customers, do you like this update? Is this something that you need? So they do a survey and they find that 90 5% of the customers like the update, 4% of the customers don't really care, and 1% of the customers said the update was bad. Seeing that the overwhelming majority of the customers like the update, the company decides to move forward with the update. But now fast forward six weeks, and the company notices a 50% drop in revenue. So what happened? It turns out that the company's three biggest clients dropped the service because the software update killed some legacy data integrations that were critical to the their business. While this is just
just like a made up artificial example. It's meant to illustrate the point that in extremistan, being wrong one time can erase the gains of being right 99 times and even beyond. If 1% of your customers are driving 50% of your revenue, that means that you can do something that 99% of your customers love and 1% of your customers hate and be much worse off. And so now we're gonna talk about fat tails. There has been a bit of controversy in extremistan. An example of this is illustrated around wealth. Going back to Pareto, this idea that 80% of the land is owned by 20% of the citizens has kind of been applied throughout economics with the prevailing sentiment being that wealth follows a Pareto-like distribution. So maybe you've heard something like this when it comes to income inequality, where it's like the top 1% has like a third of the wealth or something like that. But there's a bit of controversy around whether wealth truly follows a Pareto distribution or power law distribution or not. So the story goes something like, like this. I'll summarize wealth distribution via the mean and standard deviation. But of course, if wealth is following this power law, the mean and standard deviation are going to be useless because these are parameters for a Gaussian distribution, not so much helpful for a power law distribution. So someone will say that's useless because wealth follows a power law. But then you have someone else that's saying actually wealth fits a log normal distribution better. And then you'll have someone else that says, well, a log normal behaves like a power law distribution for high sigma. So this kind of summarizes the controversy here. And to just avoid this altogether, instead of trying to say, does some particular data set follow some particular distribution, we can instead focus on fat tails. This idea of fat tailedness, we can define as the degree to which rare events drive the aggregate statistic of the distribution. So this maps directly onto what we were talking about before with mediocristan and extremistan, where in mediocristan, rare events do not drive the aggregate statistics, while in extremistan, on, they do. To kind of connect this to different distributions, we have a sort of map of mediocristan and extremistan here. So on the far left, we have the Gaussian distribution that we all know and love. And then more generally, we can call these like student T distributions. On the right hand side in extremistan, we have the power law distributions that we've been discussing. But then we have this land in between. And we can define this as the sub exponential domain. So an example sub exponential distribution is the log normal distribution. So we can see for low sigma, it kind of looks like a Gaussian, but for high sigma, it kind of looks like the Pareto distribution. And we can kind of index different power law distributions according to this alpha parameter. So if alpha is greater than or equal to two, the distribution has finite mean invariance, which allows us to do some productive statistics with it. If the alpha value is between one and two, it has finite mean, but infinite variance. So now regression blows up up, but at least we have a mean we can work with. However, when the alpha value is below one, the mean is infinite. And this is what author Nassim Taleb calls the forget about it domain. You can't really do much when the power law has a tail as fat as this. As you can see, the space between mediocristan and extremistan, between Gaussian distributions and power law distributions is really a spectrum. So instead of thinking of this as like a binary thing as like fat tailed or not, this is really a quantity that lives on a spectrum from not very fat tailed to very fat tailed. While there's no like true way to quantify fat tailedness, there are a few heuristics that we can employ. And so here's some ideas. The first one is power law -iness. And we kind of saw this on the right hand side of that image in the previous slide, where as the alpha parameter of the power law got smaller and smaller, the tail got fatter and fatter. So we can use this tail index to kind of quantify how fat the tails are. In other words, the lower the alpha value, you the fatter the tails. And this is kind of demonstrated in this plot here. On the other side, instead of thinking of it as like power law ness, we can think of it as like non Gaussian ness. There are measures for non Gaussianity, the most popular being kurtosis. However, the problem with kurtosis is that it breaks down when the alpha value is less than or equal to four because it has infinite kurtosis. Another idea is to use the variance of the log normal distribution. And this kind of goes from what we saw in the previous slide slide where for low sigma log normal distribution looks Gaussian, but for high sigma, it looks like a power law. So if you have a log normal distribution, you can look at the variance to quantify the fat tailedness. And then finally, Taleb defines this kappa metric, which generalizes to any type of distribution where lower values have 
thin tails or don't have fat tails and large values have fat tails and kappa has a max value of one. So if you want to learn more about that, he talks about in reference number six, linked in the description below. So that was a ton of information, but to try to boil everything down, when it comes to data that follows a power law distribution to fat tailed data, the central problem that comes up in practice is insufficient sample size. Essentially, we don't have enough data to truly capture the underlying statistics. To cope with this fact, I want to leave the data practitioner with a few key takeaways that I like to think about when navigating these types of problems. So first and foremost is to plot distributions, plot histograms, plot PDFs, plot CDFs, to get an impression of how fat tailed the data might be, just kind of visually. Another takeaway is to ask yourself, is this data from Mediocristan or Extremistan or somewhere in between? Maybe turning to some of those heuristics in the previous slide to try to quantify the fat tailedness. Another key takeaway is ask yourself, what's the value of a correct prediction? But just as importantly, what is the cost of an incorrect prediction? And then finally, if working with fat tailed data, don't ignore rare events. Don't just chop off outliers. If 50% of your revenue comes from 1% of your clients, instead of this being something detrimental to your analytics, figure out how you can come up with efficient interventions in that 1% to drive even more business. And then a couple things I want to call out is if you enjoyed this video and you want to learn more, check out the blog published in Towards Data Science linked in the description below. There I cover a bit more details that I may not have covered in the video here. All the code to generate the plots that I showed here are available on the GitHub repository linked here. And if you enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing to the channel. That's a great no-cost way to support me and the content that I generate. And as always, thank you so much for your time and thanks for watching.